Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the third annual Wild Wisconsin Winter Web Conference. I'm Jamie Machuk with the Nicolay Federated Library System in Green Bay, Wisconsin. And on behalf of myself and the other systems who help sponsor this event, we are glad you are here. Um, if some of you have been listening in a lot already, you're going to get sick of hearing this same announcement. But Please understand there might be some people just joining in, so I apologize for that. Uh, we have five sessions today. We're on our fourth right now, and then we also have uh, five tomorrow, and uh, um, excellent presentations so far. And I, I know this one um, will be just the same. Our next presenter is Aaron Shea, and Aaron comes um, to us from Ferguson Libra Library in Stamford, Connecticut. And, uh, you know, when looking for for possible speakers, I often uh, browse Library Journal's movers and shakers list just to see, you know, who is up and coming, who's setting some new trends, who's bringing some energy uh, to library marketing. Marketing is always a popular topic, and I definitely get that feeling uh, when reading and just interacting with Erin, you know, that, that energy. So I'm really excited to hear what she has to say about uh, getting outside to get our patrons in. So Erin, uh, whenever you are ready. Thank you so much, Jamie, and thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be talking to some Wisconsin librarians today. Um, so my first, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background on myself and where I'm coming from. Um, I currently work for the Ferguson Library in Stamford, Connecticut, not to be confused with Missouri. Uh, and I, here I supervise two branch libraries in a large uh, urban system. And before that, I had worked for a about four years at Darien Library in Darien, Connecticut, which was a town of about 15 to 20,000 people. And uh, now I am supervising these two branches, and I've been here for about three months. So a lot of my presentation is tailored toward things I was doing at Darien, but I also do have a new perspective and sort of fresh eyes for things that you can do and how you can adapt them if you work for a city or in a big system with branches. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about today is different ways that you can actually attract non-users to your library through marketing and outreach efforts, and basically just getting out of your library. So that's the first thing to remember, that if you want to bring in non-users and boost your door count, your circulation count, your database use count, everything else, and really become the center of your community, then the first thing you have to do is you have to say sayonara to the library. And what I mean by that is you have to get out of the four walls of your library. So when you are seeing these great patrons that you've come to know and love and your regulars and even the ones that you know but you don't necessarily love but that are definitely your regulars, those are not the people you're trying to reach. They already know where your library is. They come here. It's part of their routine. So the people you want to reach are the people who live in your town or maybe work full time in your town, but the library is not part of their life and it's not really on their radar screen, um, whether that be the elusive 20 or 30 somethings that we lose from the time that they become teenagers till then when they come back when they're seniors. Um, in some communities they have trouble attracting seniors to their library and in other ones it's difficulty attracting um, young single people in their 40s and 50s. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how to get those people into the four walls of your library by first leaving the four walls of your library. So the first thing that you need to figure out is where is your community? If they're not at the library, then where are they? Are they at Starbucks because they can have coffee there and there's free Wi-Fi? Are they at Panera Bread because Panera Bread is open latest in town? Are they uh, at the beach? Are they in the office parks because they're working? Are they at the grocery store? Are they at the farmer's market? Are they at the bowling alley? Are they at the local pub? Um, how do you find out where your community is? Well, you have to spend time there. Um, I know that a lot of librarians don't live in the community where they serve, and that's okay. All it really takes is talking to your community members, maybe the ones who you already know and are friendly with that do come to your library, and say to them, you know, Think of your friends who don't come to the library. What is the reasoning? Do they feel that they don't need it because they have a place like Starbucks? Or do they feel that there's no programs or services offered to them that is kind of for their age group, for their professional group? Find out by talking to people, talking to your constituents, and also from just spending time in your town. 
maybe it means going out to dinner with your partner in town and seeing where people are hanging out and where the action is. Maybe it means just being friendly at the grocery store. Maybe you're picking up some flowers for a library program and you ask the cashier uh, where they hang out in town. Make sure they don't think that you're trying to ask them on a date. Um, maybe it's just walking around town and seeing where people are congregated and doing things in the town where your library is. But that's how you can start to figure out where people are in your community who are not coming into your library. So one place that they might be, that's an example I love to give, is office parks. I know that when I worked in Darien, we knew that there were just so many people in town who would commute to Darien early in the morning. They would probably get there leave their house maybe 7 a.m., get to Darien, go to work, and leave work 6.30 p.m. The library was not part of their routine or part of their life. And I think a huge part of that was they didn't realize that they didn't have to live in our town to get a library card. Just by working full time, they were eligible for a library card. Um, I don't know if all libraries have that kind of setup. Um, but if yours does, you should definitely take advantage of this. And even if yours doesn't, a lot of the people who are spending their time in the office parks are actually residents of your town. So it's still worth your time and worth your effort. So how do you reach out to these business parks? The first thing I recommend doing is using one of your very own library databases, something like Reference USA or Business Research Center, to figure out where the businesses are in your town and which ones are employing the most employees. When I was in Darien, we actually found out that the Whole Foods in town had the most employees. Now, a lot of those were part-time people, so they may not uh, be able to use our services in the same way that people with a resident card could. But in Connecticut, we people are able to use a library card in any Connecticut library. So even if you were part-time and had have a library card, in one town, you can also use it at the Darien Library. Um, so a lot of these other business office parks were right down in town. Uh, we would drive by them, but we never really knew what was inside. So once you have a list of these businesses that have the most number of employees in town, what you can actually do and what I recommend doing is trying to get in contact with their human resources department. And once you do that, you can explain to them that you are trying to do some outreach for the public library and you really just want to let them know that uh, you have these benefits to offer their employees. And hopefully the human resources officer will see this and as a benefit. And a lot of human resources people will be open to it because anything that will make working for their company more appealing, they'll be open to. Um, because then they can use that for recruitment purposes and to attract people to their companies. So what would you bring to these office parks? Well, I recommend setting up a table with handouts about any business resources that you offer. So do you have access to a Bloomberg terminal? Do you have business databases? Do you have a business librarian that perhaps they can come and book an appointment with? Do you carry certain periodicals that maybe these people are paying for in their home and they no longer want to pay for, but they didn't really think about the library as a place where they could read that magazine? You'll make one you'll want to make a list of these things to bring when you go and do these outreach efforts. Another thing you can do is just bring straight up books. Uh, some of them will be interested in reading business books. Those are often popular. But why not just bring some escapist novels? You know, a lot of these people will be leaving their work to go and commute on a train or a subway or some kind of public transportation. So they would love some escapist books. Or maybe you could also bring handouts about downloading digital media. Uh, maybe they're about to drive home and they would love to find out how to download an audio book onto their iPhone and connect it into their car speakers through Bluetooth. That's a great opportunity for you to do some outreach and marketing efforts for the library at these business parks. And I will go a little bit more into how you can bring things like books to these uh, places and still check them out and uh, do the normal things that you would do inside the library when checking out books. But for a business park like this, you really are coming to them to make it more convenient for them. So if you bring items like that, maybe you want to also ask the human resources department if you can then leave a box that's empty for people to return their books over the next month and you just come periodically uh, pick it up. Maybe you can even extend the loan periods for books that you bring to these outreach efforts. 
to a month, or I don't know what your loan periods are, but extend them a little bit for people who check them out at these outreach points. Um, and that can give them a little bit longer time to get them back to the library, because you don't want to turn someone off by loaning them a book and then uh, having them let it get overdue, and then they just get angry at the library and never want to come in. So that's something you'll want to think about. Um, another thing that you can promote in these business parks are uh, programs or events related to people who are working or maybe are retired but spend most of their life working. So this is a picture of an entrepreneurship series that I did at the library. And this is actually one of the founders of JetBlue speaking to the crowd um, about his experience in that world. And we gave, it, gave out name tags. We did a little reception afterward with some wine and some light snacks. And that really was to help with the networking aspect of the evening. But if you had a program planned like this and you go to an office park or some kind of big business, have a flyer about a program like this. Because that will really open people's eyes to realize, oh, the library does have something that they can offer me. Uh, maybe they never thought that the library is a place for them. Maybe they thought, oh, it's a place you go when you're retired and, or you are a stay-at-home parent and you go to check, check out books for your kids. So it's nice to open their eyes to things like this and make them realize, oh, hey, there are actually networking events for people like me who are at this time in my life focused on my career and expanding that. Um, so networking events is a great way to bring in those people who you normally wouldn't see at your library. And uh, I did tons of events at Darien Library, and I recognize probably 20% of this audience, and the other 80% are people I've never seen before. And you can even see that a lot of people came in their work clothes, so they've come straight from work, they're wearing suits. So that was definitely a demographic we didn't often reach, and I was very excited to see an audience like this. Um, maybe your community is at the local farmer's market or the grocery store. Uh, we have done outreach at the farmer's market, and people would often ask me, you know, how did you get a table there? How did you get permission? Well, all I did was go to the farmer's market as a shopper and started asking the farmers, you know, who runs this place? Who's head of the farmer's market? And a lot of them were not sure, but uh, they eventually, I eventually reached someone who was like, oh, you have to talk to this person at this stand. So I walked up to them, asked, how do I get a table? And they were like, oh, you basically just show up. So I took that to heart, and the next week I showed up with a table and a tablecloth and a tent and, and just kind of set up shop at the farmer's market. I tend to really believe in the mantra of it's easier to ask forgiveness than to get permission. Um, I figured, you know, maybe there will be someone out there who yells at the little public library for coming to bring free books to the farmer's market, but I would hope that that person would have a little perspective in that. Uh, maybe they're, they've kind of picked the wrong battle. <laughs> uh, so this is a picture of some of the books that we brought to the farmer's market. We concentrated really on bringing cookbooks. Um, I love this little shelf talker that my colleague made that says, ask me about kale. She said that it actually sprung, or started a lot of conversations, um, mostly because people just thought it was kind of funny, and they were like, oh, kale, I'll ask you about kale. Why do people like it? <laughs> that was really what people wanted to ask about kale. Um, but we brought not only cookbooks, but we also brought handouts about upcoming programs. The first year that we did it, we actually had a cookbook author program coming up. So it was a great opportunity to bring a big blow-up picture of the cookbook author's book and put a little sign on it saying, coming to Darien Library on this date. And then lots of people would come over and say, oh, I love that author. And then I could talk up the event, which was really great. Um, other things that we brought included uh, library cards. We brought just blank library cards in case people strolled by and said, oh, I'd love to check out this book, but I don't have a library card. Well, 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 we can certainly help you there. And the way we did that is we brought a little sheet of paper that has all the information that we normally put into our ILS. When we are signing up for someone up for a library card, including the little signature sign, where they have to sign indicating that they're responsible for all fines on this library card. So what we would do is take down all that information, collect the pieces of the paper, then when we return back to the library, we would set them up with that library card, and we had written down the corresponding barcode of the card that we had given them. So uh, 
uh, it was a few hours of them having a library card not hooked up in our system, but then as soon as we got back to the library, we were able to set that up for them. And they really seemed to enjoy that. And you know, some people came who did not live in town, but lived in a different town. So we got to tell them, you know, you can come to the library and take advantage of our collections, take advantage of our programs and our events. You don't need to live in Darien, and that's fine, and you're welcome. And that was nice, because a lot of people in Connecticut didn't realize that they can use their library card at any library. They think they can only use it at their hometown one. So that was a nice outreach effort that seemed to work well for us. Another place where your patrons may be going that you're not reaching them is the local senior center. Um, I always try to encourage libraries that when they have another organization in town that is doing programs or events, try to synergize with them rather than compete with them. Because we're public librarians, I mean, you don't want to, you're really there to build community and you don't want to compete with other local groups. It's not really the interest or the business that we're in as librarians. So uh, what I did in this situation was I wanted to create a sort of casual social program for seniors at the library. So we have a senior center in town. It's a very active senior center. And they were actually going through some politics in trying to justify themselves because they were moving into a new building. It was going to be expensive for the taxpayers. And they really want, were afraid that they would seem uh, that they were not necessary in the community. So I definitely wanted to be sensitive to that and make sure that I was not seen as competing with the senior center. So what I did was the senior center actually closed every day at 3 o'clock. So I said, you know, why don't I have a program series that starts at 3.30 that way? No one is competing with each other, and it really gives the seniors a new place to go after the center closes. And what I would recommend in any situation like that is to uh, contact your local organization, whether it be the senior center or a senior activities group, and have a meeting with them and sit down with them. Tell them what your goal is, ask them what their goals are, and see how you can join forces in a way that will be beneficial to both of you. Because I was so careful to make sure not to compete with them, I uh, actually they were very nice about uh, promoting my events and putting brochures up in the senior center and hanging up signs and making announcements during the lunch rush, which was really nice. I think that if I had just kind of done similar programs to them at the same time, they maybe would not have been as keen to help me out in that way. So. That's a great way to get those other members of your community into the library. Great. Uh, a question came in, Erin, mm -hmm. uh, from Renee. Um, she asks, um, were, were there problems of issuing library cards at the farmer's market with people giving incorrect information and not returning materials? That's a great question. Uh, and, and lots of librarians have asked me that when I've told them about this. So. What we would do is, of course, if someone had their library card, we would look at it and write down the barcode. If they did not have their library barcode with them, we would just take their name and their address, and then when we got back to the library, we would check out the book to them. And you're right, you're running a certain risk. Maybe they are someone who has a delinquent card, has too many fines, or maybe they don't have a card and they just lied to you. Every community is different, and we didn't have a single problem with that. Um, I don't know if it's because we were like this small, quaint town in Connecticut, um, but we didn't run into that problem. If you're worried about that, then you could, of course, have the books just for people to look at and not check them out to people unless they have a library card. Um, but you could also bring, uh, I guess, less expensive books. You know. Big, beautiful hardcover cookbooks are a lot of money, so you kind of don't want to risk just giving them out willy-nilly. Um, but you could also bring older cookbooks. You could even bring discards from your cookbook collection because, let's be honest, old cookbooks you can still always use. And then you can just give them away to people who show interest in something. Um, I think that that would be a good workaround for something like that. Okay, great. Uh, Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, the next place that we have people often during the summer and September is the beach. Darien has three beaches. And I do have to admit that I completely stole this idea from another library. I saw a picture online 
of a tent set up on the beach. And I'm really sorry that I can't remember the name of the library right now, but I saw that they had a big sign that said Beach Reads on it and some chairs. And I was like, oh, that is a perfect idea. We already have a tent, we have a table, and we have three beaches. So I definitely want to do that. Um, for this event, I actually contacted Parks and Recreation. They can be a little bit red tapey about doing things on the beach. Um, part of me thinks if I had just done it and not told anyone, I would not have gotten in trouble. But we have a good relationship with our Parks and Rec Department in that we do story times at the beach with our children's librarians. So I didn't want to run a risk of tainting that relationship, especially for the children's librarians. They would not have been very happy with me if I did something like that. So what I did instead is I called Parks and Rec and told them about my idea. And they were open to it. They normally ha charge a pretty steep fee to do an event at the beach. But they said that because we're the library and they have a good relationship with us, they would waive the fee, but they wanted to co-sponsor the event. We were, of course, totally fine with co-sponsoring the event with the Parks and Recreation Department. It's always nice to scratch someone's back when they're scratching yours, especially if it's a community organization like Parks and Recreation. So then what we did is we just brought practically the same setup that we would bring to the farmer's market. You can see the tent, the table, the chairs. We brought a lot of fun paperback beach reads, and the staff really got excited about picking out books like this. Um, I have found that in all these outreach efforts, one of the things my staff members get most excited about is helping to pick out the books that we're going to bring. And it's always a good idea to involve as many staff members as possible in decisions like that, because the, it will create more staff buy-in and more staff enthusiasm, and that just helps with everything. Um, you could see I also brought a cornhole game to the beach. I thought that, if anything, people would maybe want to play cornhole, and that would get them to perhaps have a conversation with the librarians. Um, but the cornhole was very popular, so that was fun. Uh, one thing I would do in the future that I can't believe I didn't think of this time around is there were lots of families with kids there. There was even some grandparents with a kid, and we didn't bring many children's books. We had a few with us. Uh, that we just let them play with, but we did not have a lot. And you could even bring some of those books uh, that are designed for younger children or for tubby time that are waterproof and sandproof and won't, you won't risk getting destroyed at the beach. Um, I also recommend coordinating with your children's librarians and seeing if one of them will lead a story time at the beach. I find that when you have events like this and outreach efforts, it's nice to have events planned throughout the day because it means people will really come at a certain time uh, for that event. So if we had had a story time, say, at 1 o'clock PM, I can guarantee we would have had at least like 12 little ones sitting on the beach waiting for that. And then you have the opportunity, of course, to do outreach to their parents. Um, and you can bring the normal things like library cards and brochures, anything about your programs coming up. Um, definitely something about your children's programs, because at least in our town, there's so many families at the beach. Um, but it was really fun. It was very easy to get my staff to volunteer for it, um, because who doesn't want to spend a little time at the beach? And uh, we really lucked out in that we did it on a Saturday in late August, and it had sort of an um, early fall feel to the day. So I think I was like in a dress and a sweater and was not too cold, so that was nice. Uh, ooh, this picture didn't come out that great. But the other place I wanted to say that you may have noticed your community hangs out at is the bar or the local pub. And I have found that in both communities that I work in that if you are trying to reach a group that doesn't come to the library, well, a good place to start is the local bar. Uh, there is not, I don't mean to generalize, but I'm totally about to generalize. There is not often a huge amount of overlap between the people who go to the pub and the people who go to the library. I will tell you that I'm one of those people who overlap, so I'm, I really shouldn't have said such a thing. But uh, you could see that any kind of sports bar, it might be a lot of people who the library is not part of their life or they haven't given it a huge amount of thought. Um, and they may be really excited to hear actually what you have to offer. So that brings me to my next program that really combines that idea. and. This was something I did at the end called Read, Ride, Imbibe. Uh, I was very excited about the name. And what this was designed to do was to actually reach out to our commuters and our people who meet at the pub for happy hour. Aaron, and what I decided to do, yes? Could you repeat that, what you call it again? Oh, I'm sorry. It's called Read, Ride, Imbibe. 
Um, okay. And the reason it is is because the, the gist of the program is you pick up a book at the train station when you're on your way home from work, you read it, you bring it on the train as you're commuting. It's kind of your commuting pal, so you're riding. And then about a month later, we all meet at the bar, and that's where we imbibe, and we talk about the book. Um, so this Great, actually, thank you. this came about when, uh, I'm sure you guys all remember when the Sheryl Sandberg lean-in book was super popular, and people just couldn't get enough of it. So I decided to capitalize on that, and what I did is I bought 20, 20 express copies, and I brought them to the train station on a really nice evening, and I believe it was May. And I found that people are much more inclined to talk to you when it's at the end of the day, when they're coming home from work. Maybe it's a nice day out, um, and it's toward the end of the week. I learned that the hard way from we had done a library card sign-up promotion in September, and we had done it at the railroad station because we have so many commuters in town, but we had done it in the morning before work. And no one wants to talk to you at 7 a.m. unless you have free coffee. And then they're really just kind of talking to you to pay their penance for their free coffee. So I definitely recommend if you're doing something like this to not choose 7 in the morning unless you're going to have free coffee because that really lures them in. Um, so with this program, I did it about like 7.30 o'clock p.m. in the evening and uh, had these copies of the book. You can see I also brought brochures about other programs we had coming up, coming up, like I had our One Book, One Community brochures. I also had library cards just in case someone came and wanted to sign up for a library card. And I had bookmarks. And inside each copy of Lean In was a little palm card. You can kind of see them sticking out with an image of the book. And it said, meet us at the Goose, which is the local pub truly spitting distance from the railroad station and meet us about, I believe I set the date about a month after. Uh, people read at all different speeds, so I didn't want to pressure anyone. And we will discuss the book. So about a month later, we all met at the bar. And I also want to say that this was not the only publicity we did for this. We, of course, also had press releases in the papers and had it on our website and e-blast and things like that. So it wasn't only people who were on the train who found out about it. People definitely came just to the library, picked up the book, and then met us at the bar. Um, and that was, of course, okay and welcome, too. But about a month later, we went over to the Goose. I deliberately picked a bar in town that a lot of people know. It's really a staple in town. And it is so close to the train platform that you really could just stumble there if you needed to. Um, I hope no one actually was stumbling there because people do drive home in our town. But I thought it was important for proximity's sake because I didn't want anyone to uh, be able to use, oh, it's a far drive as an excuse to not come. Um, so then we held the book discussion, and we had about 30 people come, including our town's first selectmen. So that was really great. Um, I do owe a lot of that success to the, this is a word I'm just, making up right now, the discussability of Lean In. I do think that when people read that book, they have a lot of opinions, whether they are, were a working parent or a stay-at-home parent. Uh, they all want to talk about it. So I definitely think that that helped with the discussion. Um, but another thing that helped is you can always ask the bar if they will do some kind of special for people who are attending your discussion. Um, I definitely picked a night that was off night. I can't remember if it was a Monday or Tuesday. But I figured that that would be a way we could help the bar benefit as well. Maybe it's a night when they don't usually get much of a crowd. They're bringing about 30 people. You ask the bar, hey, if someone presents their library card, can they get a dollar off their drink or some kind of happy hour special like that? And generally, the bar will be pretty uh, excited about that, especially if they know that it's a program with the public library. Um, we're lucky in that in this world, I think people generally feel like the public library is not really the enemy. Um, of course, we know there's a minority that does not feel that way, but usually people feel like, you know, what's the public library doing that's evil? Not much. They're really just helping people get free stuff. Um, so that was great, and we definitely used our reputation to benefit us. Um, Aaron? And we also, the library ordered a few appetizers just so people had something to snack on as well. Aaron, do you uh, do these um, outreach activities weekly, monthly, one at a time about how often are, are all of these happening? It definitely depends. So when we did Read, Ride, and Vibe, we did that on a quarterly basis. 
The reason for that was really budget, because you're buying 20 new books. Lean In, yes, you could see was hardcover. Mm. And at the bar, we bought appetizers for people. So it w And there are, of course, ways to get around that. You could do paperback books. Um, you could uh, not buy appetizers for people and just tell people it's um, pay as you go. Uh, and that would make it less expensive. But I know at the end of it, this program, everyone was asking when the next one was, which was oh. right here. Great. Uh, for the beach outreach, we just did that once. It was actually pretty. I think that I had gotten the idea, and when I say gotten, I mean stolen. I had stolen the idea like a month before we wanted to do it. So by then, the summer was already winding down. Um, I left Darian since then, so I hope they'll do it again next year because they have that great cornhole game to use. Um, and I bet that they will do it next year. But, yeah, we just did it one Saturday over the summer. And... When we did the farmer's market, the first year we did it, we did it every Wednesday in August. So that was four Wednesdays total. And then the next year we decided to expand because we felt like a lot of our town was away during August. So we did it every Wednesday in July and August. And that year I actually felt like we had done it a little much. Our staff started to feel a bit burnt out on it, and I really wanted to avoid staff burnout. So if I had stayed at Darien and done it again, I think I would have stuck to doing it just four Wednesdays in one month, and then it's kind of special. It's like, oh, this is the month we're at the farmer's market kind of situation. Um, when it comes to the business park, I would say maybe go there once a week for a month. Um, you could even pick a month, like maybe it's library card sign-up month, and I, which I believe is in September, and you go there every Thursday in September. I was going to say Monday, and then I was like, no one's in a good mood at work on Monday, so don't go on Monday. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> you could do every Thursday in September, uh, maybe at the end of the day as people are leaving or something, and then people kind of get used to you, and they start to think, oh, the library, where's the library? Where are those library girls? I've definitely had someone refer to me as a library girl before, and I was like, I think you mean librarian, but we'll go with that. You, you um, might have a good point, Erin, too, about the Monday mm -hmm. thing, even just as far as doing programming. Have you noticed anything? Like that, that yeah, Monday is yes. not a day people I, like. <laughs> yes, I feel like, and you know, I even agree with it in my own life. I am just, on Mondays, I'm still exhausted from the weekend. <laughs> even if I <laughs> truly did, even if I sat on my couch and rested all weekend, I still am exhausted <laughs> on Monday from the weekend. Monday is like my, my night to go home and do laundry and cook a healthy meal and go to bed early and... I just am not feeling super into going out and being social on Mondays. So I definitely agree that it's not the best night for library programs. I think that is a trend. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> so some things to remember when you're doing these types of outreach efforts. Uh, people will think you are selling something. When you have a booth set up anywhere and people standing behind that booth, they think you're selling something. I can't tell you how many times people came up to me and said, oh, what are you selling? And it was great then to say, actually, everything here is free. Um, but I bet you could attract a lot more people if they know that you're not selling something and that you're not comp campaigning for some politician before they approach your table. Uh, ways you could do that, I really believe in sandwich boards. I think that they're fun and you can always use them for different messages, so they're really uh, ambidextrous in that way. So why not get a sandwich board that says free stuff from the library or something like that? Um, I know that times when we've done outreach about our digital media, we've had a big banner that just literally says free ebooks, and free ebooks will hopefully bring people over unless they think you're L. Ron Hubbard and you're a Scientologist and you're going to try and sell L. Ron Hubbard books, um, but. Generally, using the word free will help a lot, um, or just making it really indicative that you are the library. Uh, and make sure people know that you are the library and you are not here to campaign for any type of senator or first selectman or congressman. You are here to show people how to take advantage of things that are already free to them. Um, another thing I wanted to mention is it's more fun for you, and I think it makes you more approachable when you bring a colleague or two. I actually recently read an article about networking and how when you are at a networking event, try to stay in clusters of three, because if it's just you, people are afraid to talk to you. They are afraid that they'll get stuck in a conversation with you. If you're two people, and people are afraid to approach you because they're afraid they're interrupting something. But if it's three of you, it's a much more welcoming environment uh, when people feel like, 
oh, they're having a casual conversation amongst three of them, what's one more? Um, I feel like I can walk up to them. And it will also be more fun for you because you'll have someone to talk to if there's no one around, or you'll just have someone to man the table when you got to go use the bathroom, or you'll have someone to go run off and get you guys some bottles of water if you get thirsty. Um, it's much nicer to bring colleagues with you. Uh, I mentioned this before, but people will definitely be more interested in talking to you at the end of the day rather than in the morning. But you can always bring free coffee. Coffee is a wonderful thing because it's never very expensive. So you can easily bring uh, just a carton from Dunkin' Donuts or something. I don't know if you guys have Dunkin' Donuts in Wisconsin, but it's a very New England thing here. Uh, and then bring a carton of coffee and then see uh, if more people talk to you with that. Um, usually they'll kind of take a cup of coffee and then talk to you really briefly because they really just wanted the free cup of coffee. But hey, you know, as long as they heard the word library, they're at least thinking about uh, who's giving them the free coffee and you're on their mind. Um, also, I think I mentioned this a little bit with the office parks, but you want to think about how your presence can have a positive impact on your host site. Uh, that way it's a win-win situation and it's going to create good vibes all around. So, for example, at when you're going to this business site or office park, maybe you can offer the human resources department, hey, would you like us to put together a little welcome packet to, for new employees that shows them the services the library has to offer them? That's great outreach for you and puts your name out there, but it's also nice for the human resources officers because they have this little welcome packet now. Oh, here's one of the great benefits of working for this company. You are sitting distance from this great library that has all these things for free, and even though you don't live in town. You work in town, and that gets you a card. Um, you could do something like that. And same with the senior center. You know, if the senior center is promoting your programs, maybe you have a special place where you can promote their programs and do that little exchange. It's always great to think about how you can have this positive impact on your host site, because then they're going to want to continue to work with you in the future. And you'll be surprised at how many of them approach you with outreach ideas. For example, the bar that I mentioned before where we had Read, Write, and Vibe, we had come to them on World Book Night, actually. Uh, World Book Night is a, a uh, I think it's, it must be a worldwide affair because it's called World Book Night, but basically a bunch of publishers get together, they send out free copies of books, and then there's one night, I believe it's always April 23rd, or at least it was last year, uh, where volunteers actually hand out these free copies of the books. And we had done this at that local bar, and the local bar loved it so much and enjoyed it. They were like, oh, we would love to do, have you do more programs here at the bar. And we were like, huh, that sounds great to us. So always be thinking about how your presence can have that positive impact on your host site. Because uh, like I mentioned before, since our interest is in building community and really creating our public to be the type of place where people want to go and want to live and want to be and spend time with each other. Uh, it's always good to think about local places. So <laughs> this is a picture of my roommate's cat on a tote bag from Darien Library. And I brought up this picture, A, because it's adorable, but also B, because it is great to have just a to-go bag lying around your library for marketing efforts like this. What do you put in that to-go bag? You, ha you can have some book easels for creating great book displays on the go. You can have blank library cards and some Sharpies to bring for people you're signing up for library cards. You can have a folder full of brochures, bookmarks, any other promo materials, definitely a piece of scrap paper for if you're checking books out to people, and a pen. Uh, you could also have books in there that you bring it to different places. Um, I know it will depend on the library. What we would do at Darien is if we were going to the farmer's market, we had a dummy account in our ILS called farmer's market. Before we left, we would, we would check out all the books to that dummy account so that no one would come in the library and say, oh, where's this cookbook? It says you have it. We'd be like, oh, it's at the farmer's market. Like That wouldn't be good customer service. So that's how we would do that. Um, but then when we get back to the library, you can choose to either leave those books checked out to the farmer's market and kept in your to-go bag, or if you're hoping to get those additional CERCs in-house, then you can just check them back in and put them back on the shelf and don't check them out again to the farmer's market account until you're going uh, the next week. This was just some press coverage that we had at the beach, and I brought this photo up just to talk about how you can get staff buy-in for 
outreach efforts like this. Uh, I know that every library is different, and I, at Darien, we did not work with a union. Now I currently work with a union, and the way I would approach it is actually the same in both instances, is that uh, staff who volunteer to do these things get comp time or plus time, whatever you guys call it at your library. So if you go to the beach and join me for two hours, that means you can take two hours off at some other time during the week um, at work. And for part-timers, that, of course, will differ by library. If you have the budget, then I bet you will get part-timers who want to join in on these types of things. Um, otherwise, if you don't have the budget, you may have to rely on full-timers for things like this. Uh, I was always delightfully surprised at how willing my colleagues were to join me in efforts like this. Um, they loved being at the farmer's market. I think it was nice because I spread it out through the entire staff. So it truly was just a two-hour shift once a month, and they were at the farmer's market. So a lot of them loved that. It was only two hours out of their month, and they got to be outside. Um, at the beach, lots of people wanted to come. It was on either a Saturday or Sunday, and I had done it sort of last minute, so a lot of people had plans. Uh, but you can see me and my colleague, Pat, she was very excited to come with me, and we did not even plan to match our outfits like that. But we ended up kind of matching the colors in our outfits, which was fun. Uh, and even when we did library card sign-up months at the train station and were there at like 7 or 7.30 in the morning, I was amazed at how many of my colleagues were interested in joining for that. And I think it, they were crazy morning people like I am, and they were really excited about the prospect of starting work at 7.30 and going home at 3.30 or whenever it was that day. Um, so that's a way that you can have staff it. I will say that the more outreach you want to do and the more programs like this, a lot of it is going to fall on your shoulders. Um, and I know that everybody is spread so thin. Some people are just adult services librarians that are then asked to do all these marketing and outreach efforts. At Darien, I was the head of adult programming. Outreach wasn't really in my job description or my title, but it was something I just kind of did because I liked it. And I thought that it really coincided with programs a lot. Um, so it will it will definitely fall a lot onto your shoulders. So you want to take that into account and think, you know, in a least perfect, in a worst case scenario, what if none of my colleagues want to do this with me? Do I have the time to do all of these sessions myself that I've just scheduled this for? And if the answer is yes, then definitely go ahead and do it. If the answer is I'm not sure, then maybe you would want to kind of ask informally your colleagues about it before you decide that you're going to go and spend every single Wednesday in the month of August at the farmer's market when you can't devote that kind of time there. Um, but I just want to be honest with you guys about how much will fall on your shoulders because that definitely happens, and it's just because everybody has lots of other things they're working on. just realized I couldn't remember what day I did it, but it's in that photo caption now. It was on Saturday, August 16th last year. Uh, I pulled up this picture for the presentation just because I really want someone to host a block party at their library, I think it would be a really great outreach and marketing effort. And uh, the way that you could do this is pull in local businesses. Um, you know, a lot of libraries are near local family-owned businesses. I know one of the branches I manage here is in a small village-type neighborhood of Stamford, and they're right near a big shopping center. And I would love to host a block party where I just bring in a band we have some scheduled story times, bring in bocce, badminton, some just fun yard games, and invite local businesses to each set up a booth. And then they can, uh, they'll see it as hopefully a win-win situation because they'll be promoting their business and having fun at the same time. Um, but block parties really help build community and get people to know their neighbors, which is what libraries should be doing anyway. So I have not done this yet at my library. I want to be honest about that. But it is one of my professional goals is to host a block party at one of my little branch libraries at some point. Because um, I think that if we close our parking lot, we'll have space. I don't know where people will park, but you know maybe we can stress people walking there because it's a block party. And that way, you can say hello to your neighbors along the way. I haven't really figured that out yet. but. I think a block party would be a great thing for a library to host. And that is about it for me here. I, I know that I've scheduled some time to take questions, and I would love to hear your questions. Uh, I do use Twitter pretty regularly, so f please feel free to keep in touch with me on Twitter. That is my handle, Erin Vache. And I also wanted to just give a little shout out to the Programming Librarian Interest Group. 
It's actually a Facebook group, and we have over a thousand members now. So if you're a Facebook user, I highly recommend requesting to join Programming Librarian Interest Group. I approve everyone who requests. Don't worry, um, and that way you can really take part in the conversation that's happening with tons of librarians about programming and events. Uh, that interest group is also on Twitter. Their Twitter handle is PLIG ALA, which stands for Programming Librarian Interest Group ALA. Uh, those are great resources to continue talking about things like that, whether it's promotion or, hey, has your library tried this? What would you suggest? What would you suggest we don't do? And really anything like that. Um, I'm constantly amazed at things that I learn from my colleagues just from perusing groups like that. So I hope to see you guys there. And now I'm really happy to take questions. All right, thank you, Erin. Um, as Erin said, if you if you have any questions for her, I know we've had a, a few that we've covered so far. Um, feel free to type those in the question box. Um, if you um, have uh, your question chat area closed, or if you are um, uh, minimizing your um, control panel, um, I encourage you to open that up from time to time because things that people are are saying and sharing, I'm adding to the to the um, to that question area, so you can read um, some other ideas that people are are sharing as well. Um, Aaron, Amy wants to know: Have you had any real uh, fails? <laughs> yeah, I would say that when we oh, we're having a, a hard time hearing you. Oh, sorry, sorry. I think that I moved my phone away from my mouth. Okay, now you're uh, good. I would say that when we did the early morning outreach at the train station, I I don't like to call anything a fail. I like to I like to say that if one person came, it was a success. But we really literally had, like, two people talk to us, and they were kind of like, oh, hi, what are you? We're like, oh, we're the library. And they're like, oh, cool, I love the library, bye. Uh, so we didn't really get a chance to talk about our services at all. So... While I wouldn't call it a fail, I would say that I would I would pref would have preferred it to be more successful. Um, and those are for outreach. I mean, when it comes to programs, I've had tons of what you would call fails. Uh, I did once a um, Dance Central program, which is a uh, like motion censored video game where I was, and it was supposed to be for seniors. So it's gonna have seniors come and like um, dance to Michael Jackson music with this motion censored video game. I'm clearly not a video game person, considering I'm calling it a motion censored video game. Um, it was like Xbox, whatever you call it. And no one showed up for that, so that was very sad. I'm always very sad when no one shows up <laughs> for my programs, because you've usually planned and you're really excited, and you're like, oh, well, no one else was excited about that. Oh, well, but you live and you learn. That's how you figure out what your community responds to and what they don't. Sure. Um, so what is your budget for individual outreach initiatives? Well, we really didn't have a budget for it when we did it at Darien. It was kind of like, I mean, we, let's see, we already had the table. We did buy the tent, but I don't think that we actually coded that to outreach because we figured we'd be using it for lots of things. Like we have a book sale. We figured we could use it during the book sale. We figured we could use it for programs out on our patio when it was really sunny out. Um, so let's see. I guess. What about the yeah, money? I mean, we didn't. What about the the appetizers that you purchase? Um, that came out of our programming budget. Okay. Um, so I did have a really large programming budget when I was at Darien Library. Um, at Ferguson Library, it's much smaller. Um, and I know that. It, I'm sure it depends on your library, but I feel like at my new library, there's much more attention paid toward um, not really spending money on food but spending money on the actual honorarium, which I can get behind. That sounds good to me. Great. Because, um, you know, you always want people to come for the program, not for the food, but some people would argue, well, you have to have food first just to kind of hook them in. <laughs> Great. Um, any suggestions, uh, John asks, for small libraries with a population under 1,000? Yes. For a population under 1,000, I would really lean heavily on your board. Um, at first, I was going to say create a citizen's advisory board. But if your town is already 1,000, then you probably, your citizen's advisory board basically is your library board, I bet. So I would ask your library board, I would just go to them and say, we want to do some outreach and marketing in the community. Where do you think people hang out? 
especially where do people hang out who are not library users. And I bet your board will know. Uh, hopefully your board is library users, but I bet that they spend a lot of time in the community with people who are not because they're hopefully out there advocating, so they talk about it a lot, and I bet it's something that comes out in their, up in their life a lot. So I bet they'll have ideas for you. Um, what would you say was the most um, effective outreach method, or is it the broad range of events that makes things effective, do you think? I think that, and I feel like this may not be what librarians want to hear, but it's like building an audience, and building an audience takes time. Uh, and that can be so frustrating when you're starting off and you keep hosting events that no one comes to. But it can take a, a year or more to really build an audience. And to do that, you have to start, I think, with regular program series. Um, that way, people will get used to that regular time slot. Like, we have a New Yorker magazine discussion here that I think started off with just a handful of people. And now, even when we don't have the presenter come, they still meet informally amongst themselves. I walked past them today. There's like 30 of them in our conference room because she's built such a following. But that, that took over a year to do so. Um, so it doesn't come easily. It comes with time. And if you have a strong programming lineup at your library, and you do for a while, you will build that audience, and they will start to come. Because people will talk about events that they went to at the library amongst their friends and neighbors. Uh, it just takes a long time. It, it, it means collecting email addresses, collecting contact info, uh, getting them to do things like like you on Facebook, or et cetera. Um, and that takes a while. Great. Um, Joseph asks, can you give us some details about one of uh, the networking events that you've done? Yes. So the way that that actually started is we had a meetup group called the Darien Entrepreneurs Group, and I became friends with the president of that group because his wife actually directed a play that we put on at the library. So that was just like, that happens with small town libraries. You'll find that you end up knowing everyone in town. Uh, so he said, I have someone in mind that I'd like to come speak at the library if you guys can provide the space and provide the promotional effort. And I was like, that sounds great if you can get, because he has some really good ideas for entrepreneurs that I honestly do not know if I would have been able to get otherwise. Um, but he used his own connections through being part of this meetup group to get those speakers in. And when we had the founder of JetBlue come, he actually lives in New Canaan, Connecticut, which is a neighboring town. So it's definitely a huge reason we were able to get such a big mm. name person in. Um, he also is uh, a member of the Church of Latter-day Saints, and I think that once you can kind of get someone in that group invested, then they're going to get another people in the group invested. Um, so once we had these, this connection to these speakers, we everywhere we promoted it, we called it a networking event. I think that that really helps people come with that in mind already, and that means they're going to come still in their work outfits. They're going to come with business cards because they're expecting to be able to network. Um, one of the things that, of course, really helps with networking is a little bit of alcohol. Um, I know that that is, that is more difficult for some libraries to get than others, mm -hmm. um, but we did have wine. I don't think we had beer. I think we just had white wine and water. Um, and, you know, even if you can't get wine, try and provide some kind of beverage because it does make people feel a little bit more comfortable holding something in their hand, like giving them something to do rather than just standing there. Um, I think name tags help a lot. If you are going to make it a registered program, you can even prepare those name tags ahead of time and have people check in. That makes it feel more official and like an actual networking event. Um, but name tags definitely help. And if you're a smaller group, you can even have uh, like a trigger question where you uh, it could be like it related to the topic of the person speaking. So if it's the founder of JetBlue, it could be what's one idea um, that you've had that you wish that you could turn into a business or something like that. Um, if it's a book discussion, you could have a question that relates to one of the themes in the book, something like that. Um, but that's how we had success with our networking events was linking up with that meetup group. I would definitely try and go on meetup.com and see if there's anything similar in your community or just trying to figure out if there's any kind of informal or more formal entrepreneurship group that meets in your community. Great, great. Um, uh, Jenna says, the only thing our little village has is a, a town fair thing that has a parade. Have you done anything, anything in parades with any success? 
I have not, but oh my gosh, I would love to have a float, a library float <laughs> in the parade. And I know and some libraries that do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know that uh, we had a nice Memorial Day parade in the last town I worked in. And I actually marched in it once as a member of a different organization, but there was a year that the library, we didn't have a float, we just had a banner, but a bunch of us walked uh, with the banner. And I think people liked because they would recognize librarians and be like, oh, Darian Library, yay. Um, I One of my dreams is to have a librarian float in the town parade, but I think you could also make it a great intergenerational program, have Ooh, people yeah. come and actually build the float. And I get that idea from when I was in high school and we had to build a float for uh, the homecoming parade. And we all were invited to some kid's house and we had to work on the float. Right. And there was like one kid's dad there who was really handy who was telling us all what to do. And we were mostly there just to hang out with our friends and kind of goof off anyway. But I think that would be a really cool intergenerational program and say, you know, this is the first year the library is going to have a float in the town parade. Uh, all ages, come help us. And, you know, you'll get little ones and they'll glue one thing and then they'll want to run away and play tag with their friends and that's fine. Um, uh, <laughs> but that will definitely be another thing where you have to accept right. that if the community, if not a lot show up or if they're not a huge help, a lot of it might fall to your shoulders. You have to be ready for that. Well. Yes, exactly. Um, so we're just about out of time, Erin, and I want to ask you, as I've been asking all of the other presenters, and you probably heard this with Erica, but what, what do you find most exciting um, working in libraries right now? Oh, what a wonderful question. Um, well, I want to keep it positive. Yeah, <laughs> I want to add on a positive yeah. note, not on doom and gloom. Like yeah. Really. <laughs> I would say, I mean, my passion for libraries is rooted in being part of and invested in a community. That's part of the reason I actually switched libraries recently is because I live in Stanford and I really wanted to work for a library where I was also a part of the community where I live. And whether it's through, you know, everyone of course wants to talk about ebooks and digital media and stuff, but I think what makes libraries special is it's that third place where people can go to to hang out with their friends and neighbors. And times when I've really seen that is uh, in Wisconsin, you guys are probably completely prepared for all kinds of weather, but in oh, Connecticut, yeah. we've had really <laughs> bad snowstorms and people have lost power for five, six, seven days. They all hang out at the library, and it is the place to be. And I tell you, that is my favorite time to work because you walk around like you're famous. Everyone is so grateful mm -hmm. for the library. Um, pe some people are kind of in bad moods because they haven't had power for five days, but they know that they shouldn't direct the bad mood toward you because you're really their electricity savior and heat savior at that point. Yeah. Um, so I think just library's ability to strengthen community is what I'm most excited about. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Erin. Uh, I want to mention that we do have one more session coming up at 4 o'clock uh, with Sarah Houghton, who will talk about love in libraries. Um, that will be our last session today. So thank you again, Erin, for all of the great ideas and information. Um, thank you to all of you for listening and for your great questions. Um, I hope to see you at the next session or some of our sessions tomorrow. Um, if not, thank you for participating, and uh, have a great rest of your day. And so long. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Jamie.